Well, first of all, thank you. This um, meeting is being recorded. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so welcome to this Hellenic University Club um, uh, event. Uh, um, so I am Eleni Milzakaki and um, uh, I'm so excited and happy to introduce to you today, uh, Professor Zoe Gabriel Lido. Uh, there is no way I can make these introductions without my cheat sheet because her um, her record of achievements and activities is is too long for my um, uh, aging brain. Um, so <laughs> so I'm gonna use my my cheat sheet and tell you that well, um, uh, Professor Gabriel Lido is professor of linguistics at the Department of um, um, of Greek at the Democritus University of Thrace. Uh, she has served as the head of the Department of Greek, as the Dean of School of Classics um, uh, and uh, Humanities, as Vice Rector of Academic Affairs at the same university. Uh, she got her, um, she has a very rich educational background. She got her PhD from uh, University Paris 13. Um, and um, just to, to combine it as a sole author, co-author or editor, she has published 24 books already. Uh, she has um, two numerous scientific publications in top journals and conferences. Um, her research on uh, lexicology, pedagogical lexicography, language learning strategies and computational linguistics has been funded and recognized and acknowledged by multiple international grants and awards. Um, she has been the president of the European Association of Lexicography, and um, more recently, in collaboration with the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, she uh, now leads the development of the curriculum for teaching Greek as a heritage language. And uh, currently, she uh, is on sabbatical, and she's a visiting scholar at the University of uh, Chicago. So, um, and that is just a summary of uh, what she has accomplished so far. I also know that she has had great impact on her students, um, a very, very caring professor. And I'm so excited that we will have the opportunity to learn uh, from Zoe today. So Zoe, the floor is yours, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Eleni. I'm very glad to be here with you today, and I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me on the behalf of the Hellenic University Club to deliver this talk. Uh, I would also like to thank Anastasia Janakidou for hosting me this year at the University of Chicago and the Center of Hellenic Studies, which she directs. So my presentation is entitled Greek Language Through Time, and actually in this presentation, pres Presentation, I will attempt a brief overview uh, of the history of Greek language with special emphasis on the Greek vocabulary. I will also try to highlight the contribution of Greek language towards languages and actually especially to scientific vocabulary. And uh, let's see now what's the fate of ancient Greek words in the into the modern world. Actually, what happened to this world, to these ancient, ancient Greek words? Before doing so, I would like to share with you a timeline with the phases of the history of Greek language. And so we have, first of, first of all, the pre-Hellenic phase. This is not an Hellenic phase, and I will talk about pre-Hellens in a while. Then we have the proto-Hellenic, the ancient Greek phase, the Hellenistic Koine, the medieval Greek, and then the modern Greek, which starts in uh, uh, 1,100 years before, uh, after, sorry, uh, before Jesus, after Jesus Christ. So, before going on, I would like to start with a short quiz and ask you which of the following words, if any, is or are borrowed in Greek from other languages. I would like you to answer your, uh, to give me your answers in the chat. So I'm waiting for you. Is the word spiti, thalassa, rigani, galeos, computer, which one of these uh, is a borrowing from another language. Please be my guest, write in the chat your answers. It can be one or more, correct? It's not only one. So we have some people who know, for instance, that speed is from uh, Latin, hospitium, yeah, computer, of course. 
So I've seen, I've seen someone who said, let me check who is that, that all of them are borrowings. So yeah, actually that's the correct answer. All of these words are borrowings from another language. Actually, Spiti, it's from Latin language. Uh, thalassa, Rigani, and Galeos are from the pre-Hellenic substratum, so they are not Greek. And also, we have the word computer, which is borrowed from English. So that was a very uh, brief introduction. Oops, why I can't move? Have a ah, great, yeah. So thalassa. Uh, thalassa, yes. Yeah, can you please explain? I mean, I mean, when yeah. I'm yeah, can you please explain the origins of the word thalassa? You said it's not Greek? I said that this word belongs to the pre-Hellenic substratum of uh, the Greek language. This existed before Greeks. And when I, I'm speaking about Greeks, I am speaking about the Indo-Europeans who came in Greece at the later age than this word existed in the area. So that's why I consider it to be a borrowing in the Greek, between parentheses, Indo-European language okay is how, do clear know that? how do we know that how do you know that that is a born from pre-greek i mean historical linguistics have all the uh, methods and uh, the research that proves that this word is far much older than uh, the greek uh, words belonging to the Indo-European language. So that's why we know there are some methods which permit, uh, scientific methods, of course, which permit to arrive to such uh, conclusions about the origin of words and how they came into the Greek language. And we can discuss about that later on, if you want, or at the end of this conversation. OK? So uh, let me start, actually, with the pre-Hellenic substratum. And why we call them pre-Hellens? Because they lived in the Hellenic Peninsula and the Greek islands before the Indo-Europeans immigrated here. So the whole area in question seems to have been linguistically homogeneous. And these populations had a remarkable civilization. Carians, Lelegians, Pelasgians, and Minoans belong to this pre-Hellenic substratum. Minoans? We all know they built large and elaborate palaces up to four stories high, featuring elaborate plumbing systems, and they decorated their palaces with frescoes. Uh, so we find words like megaro, solin, indicating their building expertise, but also irini and vasilev. You know that in the European word for vasilev, it was annex. So this word belongs to uh, Vasilev, belonged to the um, pre Hellenic substratum. So, showing that there was a significant social organization. Well, you know that actually language depicts or reflects the social um, situation. Okay, so uh, the majority of fish names are also pre Hellenic, Atherini, Galea, Scombros, and also all the Mediterranean plants like Daphne and origanos. So this word, we have inherited them in Greek through this pre-Hellenic substratum. Of course, that's normal because the Europe Europeans coming from the Northern mountains didn't have names for fish and in general for the Mediterranean uh, fauna and flora. So what we had also, consonant clusters like nthu, double t, Double s, nrnu, found in toponyms, mainly in Peloponnese and Crete, were also pre Hellenic words like Corinthos, Zakinthos, Olinthos, Tirinsa, Imitos, Kifisos, but also words like Iakinthos and Thalassa. So, this is a very nice opportunity to ask you another question. Why do we have in Greek words? Finishing in Isa, which is written with double S, and some other words are written with only one S. When we were kids at school, do you remember? We were told that all the selections put a young Seisa, grafo de medio sigma, exerite y melisa, y signum, y larisa, y sarisa. So, why do we have this uh, exception in the great rule of the words finishing in Isa? What would you say? Would you like to suggest something or guess something or? 
Well, I can tell you that this happened because we, these words came into the Greek vocabulary for differ, from different paths. For instance, we know that the word sarisa came from the Macedonian dialect, while the words like melissa, basilisa came into the Greek vocabulary through this pre-Hellenic substratum. That's why we have these different forms of words finishing in finishing in this. Okay, so let's now talk about the first phase of Greek, which was the Indo-European Proto-Hellenic. Actually, Indo-Europeans were farmers and nomads, and they had learned to domesticate horses and knew how to build the wagons for trans transportation. Horses and wagons gave them the possibility to travel longer distances than before. So you can see here how they moved in various places. Uh, in Europe, and also in branch of Indo Europeans, this one, okay, moved between 2022 uh, to the Greek peninsula. Okay, uh, so they passed through Romania and the Eastern Balkans to the Evros River Valley, from where the main body moved west. And uh, in the Greek Peninsula, they met the Pre-Hellens, who um, a lot of them became the Ilotes, the non-Ilotes, well, the slaves. The Indo-European immigration was held in subsequent waves. So we had what, what is known like Cathodos ton Achaeon, Cathodos ton Dorion, et cetera. Etc. So in this graph, in this graph, okay, uh, you can see the relations between different uh, Indo-European languages, and we can discuss about this graph later on. The population brought with them Greek language and actually Proto-Greek language, also known as Proto-Hellenic, which emerged from uh, the diversifi diversification of the Proto-Indo-European language. The language came into contact with a local language, this the pre-Hellenic one, and was also affected by external factors such as further immigration and by the fact that the Indo-European immigration was held in subsequent uh, phases, waves. So each tribe wrote its own language. This led to dialectization, and never again so many dialects coexisted in such a small area like Greece. So modern dialectologists group the ancient Greek dialects into four main subfamilies. The Arcado Cypriot, the Attic Ionic, the Aeolic, and the West Greek, corresponding more or less to the different tribes of Indo Europeans. And let's see a very nice example. For the number Tessera, four, we had the Ionians who pronounced Tetares, the Athenians who said Tessares, it was the Ionians, Tetares, it was the Athenians the late Ionians, Tesseres, and then we had the lesbians, Pessires. So you hear me pronouncing the double S. Why? Because ancient Greek used to pronounce each letter with a separate pronunciation. So double S was pronounced for them. Do you, have, do you know any modern Greek dialect that does so, that pronounces the double consonants? Cypriot. In Cypriot Greek, we can hear the double consonants. I don't know if we have with us some people from Cyprus, so they could verify that. Yeah, also we had the Boesians who pronounce- I confirm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Natalie. Great. So let us pass now to the next phase of Greek, the Hellenistic Koine, and let's see how Hellenism was during the Hellenistic period. Actually, Greek language came into contact with a lot of, the, of different languages at that, of that period, and this caused major changes in Greek. So actually at this phase, ancient Greek evolves to the Koine. And you can see in this slide how the borders of the Hellenistic world, world were. And Greek is spoken in this whole area. So you see, um, it's a, yeah, a big area. And there is language contact between Greek and other languages spoken in this area. And of course, this affected Greek very much. So we have the birth 
of Koine, which I would like to stress mm -hmm. is the binding ring between ancient Greek and modern Greek. So a lot of changes happened during this period. We have a lot of strong linguistic activity, which leads from, uh, leads from ancient Greek to, uh, let's say, in another phase of Greek. And I would like to ask you if someone knows which uh, ancient Greek dialect was at the basis of Koine. Or you can write in the chat if you want. Which was the ancient Greek dialect that was at the base of Koine? The answer is that it was the Attic dialect. But could you imagine why? Why the Attic was selected to be the base of Koine? There are some historic, cultural, economic, political, and military reasons. For instance, uh, Attic was adopted, you know, we know very well, by in Macedon by Philip before the conquests of Alexander the Great and the subsequent rise of Hellenism. So it became the standard dialect that evolved into Koine. But Attic was also used in high literature by the Attic orators, Lysias, Isocrates, Aeschines, Demosthenes, the philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, and the historian Xenophon. Thucydides also wrote in Old Attic, and the tragic playwrights Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides also used it, and also the comic playwright Aristophanes wrote in this dialect. So Athens was a Britannia Sophia's, and everybody used to go to Athens to study, as everybody had to learn Attic. So that's another reason, that's a cultural reason. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, Attic was spoken in Athens. So Athens was an economic superpower of that age, and its language was prestigious. Piraeus was selected to serve as the port city of classical Athens, and it was transformed into a prototype harbor concentrating all the import and transit and transit trade of Athens. So we can see some economic reasons uh, leading to being uh, to adopt the uh, Attic as the basis of Koine. Athens was also a political superpower, and it was the leader of the Athenian League. So Athenians imposed their language to their allies, okay? And also finally, Athens has gained prestige among the Hellenic cities because of their involvement and leadership during the Persian Wars. So that's why this specific dialect, Attic, <clears throat> was adopted as the basic of Koine. Let's see some changes that took place in the phonology of the Greek language during the Hellenistic times. The ancient distinction between long and uh, short vowels, were, vowels were, was gradually lost. And from the second century, century before Christ, all vowels were isochronic. What does this mean? At uh, the ancient years, we had, for instance, epsilon, which was pronounced e, and we, we also had eta, which was pronounced e. So at this age, the pronunciation of theta and epsilon become the same, and then the eta is pronounced, it arrives to be pronounced as e. Uh, also, so with this uh, change, we have now three e. The epsilon, which used to be pronounced as u, something like u, the yota, and also the eta. They are all pronounced as e. So suddenly we have three letters with the same pronunciation. The same happened with the diphthongs, alpha, yota, epsilon, yota, and omicron, yota. They used to be pronounced like something like I, A, and OI, and they become now monothomes, E or E. And this led to what we call historic orthography. The pronunciation, what's, what's the historic orthography? The pronunciation changed, but we kept ancient spelling of the words. And this causes a serious problem to young speakers today because they can write with the appropriate um, for, form in written. So it is funny now, I would like to ask, do you know an expression in Greek which uh, prasinaloga? Do you know this expression? If you don't know it, it means that you say some stupid things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the etymology of this expression is prasein aloga. 
That means to do stupid things, nonsense things. So with the change of pronunciation, we used to hear not prasin aloga, but prasin aloga. And people then uh, use this, uh, what we call um, false uh, etymology. And they thought it has to do with something with this, which is green. Okay, so let us see another phonological change, but before, again, okay. Uh, but before that, can anyone tell me why we use in Greek two letters for representing the sounds bu, du, and gu? Why do we use mi pi, mi taf, gamma gamma, or gamma kappa for representing the sound bu, du, and gu? Do you have any idea? What is this? Why do we use? Did anyone say something? Letters. Because they didn't exist before. Exactly. Well, Budu Gu existed before, but we had some other sounds we didn't, which didn't exist. Actually, and in Greek didn't have the sound V, V, and V, because the letters Vita, Gamma, and Delta were pronounced B, D, and Gu. So the word, the ancient word Vus, we can see here, was pronounced both. At this period, new sounds enter Greek language, and the letters Vita, Gamma, and Delta are used to represent the fricative, as we linguists call them, sounds, V, V, and Gu. So the sounds Bu, Du, Gu were left without a letter, without a representation. At that age, the Greek philologists proposed the use of Mi, Pi, Ni, Taf, and Gamma, Gamma, or Gamma, Kappa uh, for these sounds. That's why I, uh, when I was a kid, we had the word. This one, do, we, do I have it here? Andras, but nobody pronounced the word Andras as Andras. We all said Andras, even though we had the delta over there. Why? Because we, we kept the ancient pronunciation of delta is D. Okay, the same. Uh, Zoe, can I make a, my only, the one thing that I know that uh, uh, relates to what you are saying, and I was so fascinated when I, um, I learned about it, and this is how do we know? that what we see as vita in um, in modern orthography was actually pronounced b in ancient greek mm -hmm. uh, so it was a uh, i um uh, as you probably know i i studied uh, uh, linguistics at, at penn and uh, one of my professors uh, was don rinch who's a historical linguist and mm -hmm. um uh, i was so very curious so i was very very excited to find out that the the way that we knew that the Greek vita was pronounced b and not v uh, at the time is because there were um, descriptions of the sounds that sheep made. And um, in writing, the, the sound that the sheep made was written with vita, but we know that the sheep sounds is not v, <laughs> it's a b, 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 and not v, v, v. And that's how kind of they um, concluded that the um, the pronunciation of that particular letter was b and not v. Anyway, that's the only thing that. Yeah, thanks, Len. And, and, and I was so excited uh, when I heard about it. So I wanted uh, to share it since it seemed uh, very uh, relevant to this slide. Thanks, Eleni. I have put in the chat what the provaton used to do in ancient Greek. V, V, but this V, V wasn't pronounced as V, V, it was pronounced as B, B, because Ita was a, the long E and Vita was a B. So these onomatopoeces, onomatopoetic words, as we call them, prove that the Vita was pronounced as Bu, but there is also another reason, if you ask me. We know very well from the ancient sources that uh, the Greek alphabet was um, borrowed by the Latin, by the Latins, so they used the Greek language, especially from the Halkidan, the one from Halkidi, Halkida, okay. So uh, the Latin alphabet has now the pronunciation as it was in ancient Greece, in ancient Greek. So this is also another reason that we know that beta was pronounced as bull. Let me 
close that now. And I would also, yeah, I would also like to say that the, uh, that the letters uh, phi, theta, and he, which were initially pronounced as aspirates, uh, p and p, like the pan in English, for instance, they developed into fricatives. So they were used then to uh, represent fu, fu, and who. Okay, so let's see some more interesting things. Even more important changes happen to Greek vocabulary at the Koine phase. Inherited words changed meaning. For instance, the diminutive of opson uh, gave us opsarion, and this was uh, opsarion used to mean appetizer, mezadaki, okay? And now this opsarion comes to mean fish. Also, uh, uh, of course, okay. Uh, simple words were replaced by diminutive derivatives. For instance, we have the word os, and this gave the otion. And from the word otion, we have today the word afti. Also, the same with alos, which gave the diminutive alonion, microaloni. And today we say aloni. And some new suffixes are used to create uh, new words, for instance, especially color terms. For instance, the suffix inos uh, to form terms denoting color. We had the chloron prasso. Chloron prasso is the fresh leak. And this, with, that, uh, with the adjunction of the inos, gave us the, the color prasino. The same with erythroscopos. It was a substance for uh, dyeing hair or cloth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this gave us the word kokino. Because how? What was the term for the term for the for kokino in ancient Greek? Erythros. Okay. Great. And we have also that we had also the word chains meaning under uh, word chains meaning under the influence of Christianism. For instance, we had the word paradisos, uh, which comes from the Persian paradisa, which means a uh, walled or fenced garden. And uh, with the influence of Christianism, this changes meaning and becomes, of course, the paradise as we know. Great. And talking about uh, meaning change, it would be interesting to discuss a little bit how the meaning of a word uh, may change. So uh, the meaning of a word may become wider. For instance, uh, we have the word leg, body, but we also have the leg of the chair. And this becomes like that through metaphor. But the word may also become narrower. For instance, we had in ancient Greek the word poet, P.T.S., and meaning the creator in general. But today we have a restriction of meaning and the P.T.S. is actually the creator of poems only and don't, uh, not uh, in general. We, um, word may also become, uh, may have a better meaning. For instance, we have the Leventis, uh, who was a pirate, and also Leshi, who, were, who was the place where uh, uh, thieves were used to gather together. And today, these words don't have this negative meaning as in ancient uh, Greek, but of course, we have the very famous examples, Poniros, Mochthiros, and Panurgos. Do you know what does this mean, uh, used to mean in ancient Greek? Come on, do you know? Can you guess? Ponos and Tiros, Mochthos and Tiros, and Panergon. So what this could mean? This could hard working. Okay, so that was a good sense. But today, these words don't have a very good meaning. Uh, why? Do you know why? Because these words, these adjectives, used to refer only to slaves. So they acquired this bad meaning. The same with agathos, uh, which used to mean brave. And today it means someone who is not very clever. So we have in the historical process of the Greek language, one can notice two parallel strains. We have uh, one consists of what we call international Greek, and the other is what we call modern Greek. 
And actually, international Greek refers to the vast uh, number of philosophical, scientific, and other terms uh, present in the modern languages that have their lexical uh, basis in ancient Greek. And when we refer to modern Greek, on the other hand, uh, actually uh, is a full-scale language, but geographically and numerically restricted to Greece, Cyprus, and the Greek communities abroad. I'm not sure that they use it always, but we can say that. And uh, the two strains are converging today since several hundred thousand words of international Greek are coming again into modern Greek. Okay, since several, several institutions of social life, the first sciences and philosophy originated in ancient Greece, words expressing these human activities were created in Greek, whence at first through the intermedia intermediary of Latin, uh, they were used to enrich the cultural life of the modern world. But Latin, Though, too, after the first impetus received from the Greek speaking world produced new cultural material, and the original source created a tradition so that today science continues to draw heavily upon, upon the two, these two classical languages in order to respond to new needs for our denomination. Modern civilization, having assimilated its initial formative elements, creates now Latin and Greek words, which neither existed nor could have existed in antiquity when science and technology were comparatively restricted. A word like that is the word photography, okay? So, conversely, well, yeah. When the modern world and in particular the West began creating civilization on its own, of its own, new ideas and knowledge started flowing from the new centers into Greek, bringing with them many of the words expressing these ideas. And this reverse movement resulted in ancient Greek words returning to modern Greek, often with a changed meaning. As in other languages, in modern Greek, there are inherited words, for instance, words that either this themselves or their individual elements have continuously existed in the language for a very long time, even with a modified form or and pronunciation. So we can see the word thalassa, mitera, patera, ske, gotro. These are inherited words. But in some cases, there are serious changes. So the word phai becomes from the infinitive phaiin of the root fa, of the verb throw. The same from with ladi, which comes from elavon, meaning eleon, etc. So in this case, we can't always understand the uh, connect the two forms, the modern one and the older one. The first achievements of uh, the ancient Greeks were in areas of athletics, medicine, philosophy, mathematics, political organization, navigation, and uh, military art. And here are some of the characteristic terms of these areas that passed into Latin and thence into the modern languages. Okay, so we have some words like that. And yeah, so actually that was the transparency, I will say. So we, we can see some examples here like athletes, hippodromos, epilepsia, philosophia, dialectiki, musiki, grammatiki, historia, geometria, arithmetiki, strategia, etc., etc. So all these words have passed to other languages uh, through um, Hellenistic koine. But other words from ancient Greek entered and keep entering the modern languages directly without the intermediate of Latin. Words like erotikos or words like aristokratia, aristocracy, demokratia, democracy, politiki, uh, politics, etc., etc. So we have two different paths uh, um, leading Greek words coming to other languages like English. 
During the Hellenistic period, with the further development both of science and theological contemplation, new words or older ones with modified meaning enter Latin to finally become common property of the rest of the world. Here we have some examples like geography, astronomy, astrology. In ancient Greek, astrology used to mean uh, astronomy, not astrology, okay? And also we had the uh, older word theologia, which acquired a very special meaning and passed into Latin under the form theolo theologia. As was the case with ancient Greek words, so also many Hellenistic ones have been adopted directly by modern languages without the intermediate of Latin, words like biographia, biography, or endoma. Can you see that insect is an exact calc from the Greek endomo? And in endomo, we, say we have en and temno, the same in the word insect, in and sect. Okay. <laughs> the Greek origin of some words is not so obvious. For instance, the word paravoli, in ancient Greek, this used to mean comparison, illustration, etc., became in the Hellenistic period the Latin word parabola, particularly in uh, its use of the parables of Christ, actually the, the speech par excellence, okay, of that time. And this word lies in the origin of the French parole, the Spanish palabra, the Italian parola, etc., etc. Also, uh, the word Let's see another example. Also, the word scholi, scholi, sorry, in ancient Greek used to mean leisure, rest. This gave the Latin scola, and uh, this gave also the French école, the English school, the German schule, etc. Or the word angel, angelos in Greek, angel, became in Latin angelus, in French ange, in German angel, in English angel. So you can see how this word went to different languages, or even the word cimiterium became through the Latin cimiterium, the French cimetière, the English cemetery, the Italian cimitero, etc. Such words were introduced through the popular and not through the learned tradition, uh, were incorporated from the start into the new languages emerging in the Middle Ages. So, uh, they present more changes in form. That's why we can't uh, um, connect them with ancient book words. Ah, sorry, the word disaster. Yeah, I forgot to tell that. Where is that? So do you know uh, what's uh, the etymology of the word disaster? Is the one uh, who is born under a bad star. Disaster, okay. This gave the disaster, disaster, etc. Uh, okay. Yeah, the convergence of cultures that took place during the Hellenistic and Roman times gave life to formations of multiple origin, many among them being not direct loans, but loan translations. So the word angelos, which in ancient mean, Greek used to mean the messenger, passed into other languages with its new meaning, which is a long translation from the Hebrew melek. Okay, because you know, in ancient Greek, angelos used to mean messenger, and today is a specific messenger, the messenger of God. And this is under the influence of Hebrew. The same with uh, the word Christos. In ancient Greek, uh, it was used for anointment with oil, like chrisma, chrio, okay? Uh, and this is the long translation of Aramaic Messiah. Mm -hmm. Became in Latin Christus, acquired the Latin, uh, the Latin suffix anus. This gave the word Christianus, and this returned into Greek as Christianos, to give further Christianismos, etc., etc. A large, a large number of new formations within the modern languages are based on ancient Greek words. So English policy is based on ancient politia, state, but also we have the word police that comes from that. 
and several hundred thousand words of Neo-Latin of the modern languages and in general of uh, the international scientific vocabulary are based not on full words, but on lexical elements of ancient Greek and of Latin, which today serve as affixes and cofixes for combining form. We can see in this transparency some of these. So we have hyper, anti, mega, ismos, paleos, neos, etc. So I'll tell you a funny thing. My daughter was never a very good student back in Greece at the language course. But here she's very strong, especially in courses like uh, English and also biology. And she tells me, mom, I understand all the new kids, all the uh, new terms in biology because they are Greek. And I wonder why English people, students here can't understand them. So. That's because she has in her heritage all these uh, prefixes or suffixes, and that's transparent for her. Okay. So, a movement in the reverse direction from Latin into Greek started already during the Hellenistic period. Some characteristic examples are the Latin hospitium, it was the guest chamber, which gave the Hellenistic hospitium, the medieval spiti, or the Latin porta, the, which gave the Hellenistic porta gate, which in the Middle Ages acquired also the meaning of the Italian porta, as we know it today, door. Okay, an example of a long translation is also the ancient triangles. What was Thriangos in ancient Greek? It was a hymn to, Di to Dionysus. And uh, this in Latin became triumphus. This gave the Hellenistic Thriangos with a new meaning as we have today. And in contemporary Greek, loans increase. And we have words from modern languages, particularly those char characteristic of uh, contemporary technological advancements, which are adopted in modern Greek words like computer um, and other words from other languages. Okay, some words passed from an older period of Greek into other languages, once they return after a long time, we change form and meaning. For instance, we had the Hellenistic conopion, which was a couch with mosquito cartons. That's the conopion or conopion. This gave the Latin conopeum. This gave the French canapé, and we took it back as canapés. So we call this whole procedure a reborrowing. It is a term that other civilizations borrowed from Greece, and then we reborrow re it from them with a change meaning and form. And we have a lot, yeah. yeah. Is, there any, is there any question? Okay, we have a lot of examples like that here. So we had the word diphthera, which gave tefter in Turkish, and we took it back as tefteri. We had the Ponticon Carion. What was the Ponticon Cario? Tokaridi apoton ponto, which gave Findic in Turkish, and we took it back from Turkish as Funduki. The same with Bora, which was, of course, the Boreas, or Boreas, which also gave Burini. We had also the word Ampula, which comes from Amphoreas. And yeah, the Conopian, we have seen it. And the Tartaruga also, which, can, which uh, comes from Tartarukos. This is a very nice uh, procedure. Some more examples like that. We have the Enkikleos Pedia, which gave Encyclopedia. And we took it back as Enkiklopedia instead of Enkikleos Pedia. All this procedure is called, as I told before, the reborrowings. But the most important development is the fact that thousands of internationalisms based on ancient Greek lexical elements are coming today back into modern Greek. And let's see some examples. Uh, acoustiki, cardiologia, diachronia, ecologia, magnetismos, melodrama. These are words which are not created in Greek. These are words which are created either in English or in French, and we took it 
to, to, we took them back in Greece. These are called, interna are called internationalisms. Uh, the encounter of ancient Greek and of the modern languages sometimes is accomplished in a rather peculiar way within modern Greek. Ancient words are used again, but in order to trans translate words of the modern languages, particularly of French. And this happens in, uniquely in Greek, only in Greek. This procedure we can find it in another language. Let's see some examples to understand better what I told you. In ancient Greek, we had the word ekdromi. In ancient Greek, the word ekdromi used to mean military attack. So uh, today we use the word ekdromi with a different meaning. It's the meaning we find in France as in excursion, excursion, go, go out for leisure. The same with ekneurizome. Ekneurizo or ekneurizome used to mean cut the tendons. But today, translate the French enervé or s'enervé. The same with the word politismos. In Hellenistic period, it used to mean public administration. Politismos. Today, it now translates French, uh, the French word civilization. Okay, so you see, this is a unique Politismos. phenomenon that we find only in Greek. And before closing, let me now ask you some etymologies. So now I would like you to participate. Who knows the etymology of the word tsibusi? What the word? Tsibusi. What's the etymology of this word? Or Tsibosio. Thank you very, very much. Yes, actually it was the word Tsibosio with a phenomenon called Tsitakismos. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, what's the etymology of the word Liono? Leos. It was, yeah, exactly. It was Leos. The word Malono. <laughs> Let's, let them see here. So Tsibusi comes from Sibosio. Liono is from the adjective Leos, because you know that when the ice cream Lioni, it becomes Leo from all the parts, okay? And you know that the verb Liono at the beginning, it was written with Epsilon Iota, but now that it has lost this connection with the adjective Leos, it's not transparent anymore. Now we write it with a Iota. The same with Malono, which comes from the uh, adjective Omalos, when we malonum someone, actually what we do is to make the, the character of the children, for instance, smoother. The same, well, the etymology of the word agori, which is the privative alpha and ora. So uh, uh, agori is the one who is not at its time. So it's aguros. And the same with the etymology aguros, which means something that it's not at its time, it's asteritico, uh, privative, and ora. And finally, the contrary of that, orimos, is the thing which is on time. So with, um, with some etymologies like that, I would like to close. I will put you in the chat <coughs> this. Uh, let me take the example this link where we can find some episodes okay great and let me go back to my last transparency okay so in this link that i have put in the chat we can you can find some funny episodes of a series called philoglossia where i analyze some fun examples like the ones i gave you before so as a conclusion i would like to tell to share with you that a language remains alive only if it changes so greek has changed it is simplified but it is it, it has an uninterrupted uh, presence through uh, centuries. 
as it, would, as it was connected with an important civilization, it is considered today as a prestigious language, closely connected with science, philosophy, and arts. And this is where I would like to stop. And I'm now eager to answer to your questions, and I hope to have a lot. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Zoe. Um, uh, wow, <laughs> that was a lot of information. Um, fascinating. I do have questions, but I'm going to be nice and nice host and give the floor uh, to our uh, guests. So please use um, the... Can you use? Do we have the reactions alive there? Oh, can you see? Can you... Or, or just turn on your, your videos? Actually, yeah, why don't we turn on the videos now that we are... Uh, here to do a nice discussion and um, um, yeah please who yes Evangelos has a question go ahead first off, first off, I mean thank you very much my name is Evangelos Valianados and I'm speaking to you from California um, mm, welcome you know I studied Korais Adamadius Korais and uh, Adamadius Korais was vociferous against the foreign vocabulary of the Greek used in the late 19th century early 20th 19th century. And he spoke about to clean up this mess from Turkish and Slavic and so on. And after that, you have the so-called Katharevusa, the Greek that was supposed to have been cleaned or cleansed of this foreign uh, unnecessary vocabulary. And today I hear, I mean, I'm in California, so I hear that there is a new tendency in Greece to use Greeklish that is to use the English alphabet to write Greek. And my question to you is, is this true? And if this is true, this is a grave danger to the survival of the Greek language. I remember listening to Dimitris uh, Vogelis, who was a former general, and now he's very concerned about the survival of modern, of, of modern Greek by this business of Greek list. This xenomania. <laughs> what do you think about all that? Yeah, okay, thanks very much for this very interesting question. And actually, I'm very glad you've mentioned Korais. Yes, indeed, he wanted to clean the language. Okay, but he had to serve a national cause because it was at the period of uh, the Afotismos. Okay, so uh, they needed to prepare the Greek Revolution. Okay, that's one thing. Then you asked about the Greeklish, but we don't have to to um, confront. We don't have to naberdepsume. How is that in English? Confuse. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Example, so, okay. Yeah. We don't have to confuse two different things. Speaking a language is another thing, yes. and writing a language is another thing. How we write a language doesn't act, uh, affect language itself. So if we write it with Greeklish or if we write it with Greek characters or any other language uh, character, this won't affect the evolution of Greek language. So we don't have to worry. Actually, do you, have you heard the word phragochiotica? No. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So what was Fragohiotica? It was people from Hios who they were, you know, traders, etc. They used to live abroad. So they speak a very high a variety of Greek, but they used to write it with the Latin alphabet. And that's a Fragohiotica. And Lakwats didn't wasn't affected at all. So we don't have to worry because writing is another thing and speaking is another thing. If we we would have um, <laughs> For instance, a lot of loan words in Greek uh, only from English, then maybe we would be we would worry. But uh, with writing, no. And there is actually a very nice episode in Philoglossia. Please find it and hear why we don't have to worry about that. Well, related to what you're saying, is the Greek state, that is the Ministry of Education, supporting this Greek list stuff? But listen, let's consider another thing. Where is this <laughs> Greek list used? I can see it only. I don't know. I yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you. I can see it only in the chat with between friends. So it's a very specific communicative situation. So it's only young people who use that. My mother, I don't use it. My mother doesn't use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's only younger people who use it in their between communication. 
I want to add that is uh, that it's being phased out. It was a specific uh, transition, actually. Um, I think a very specific time frame uh, and uh, how old people were when um, computers became very popular, but the Greek fonts were not as um, um, available mm -hmm. <laughs> as as they are now. So I think we clearly are seeing a phasing out of the Greek Greeklish because now it is. Um, both very uh, accessible, so most it's so super easy in most devices to have uh, a Greek keyboard. At the time that Greeklish flourished, it was very hard to get Greek on any keyboard, right? So people had to somehow find a way to um, to, to kind of write in Greek with uh, Latin characters, and that was out of necessity. Clearly, for some time, I think it just became a habit. But as now the devices have um, uh, not only uh, accessible uh, keyboards in multiple languages, but also all the spell corrections, because people also are very yeah. aware, right, that they may make mistakes and that would be embarrassing and so on and so forth. But now you have all these sort of corrections. And I, um, why, without having the data really, but I clearly see a uh, phasing out of uh, Greek, um, uh, but, you know, as, as time uh, goes by. I think there are more some very specific group of people that were caught at the time where there are there were computers, but not easily accessible <clears throat> keyboards that uh, uh, developed the habit of Greek. This, uh, this, this, this is Dr. Effie Christie. Uh, I just want to add to the conversation. Um, we've been using uh, translating Greek into English phonics for a very long time. Even, even our choirs where we have many members who can't read the Greek alphabet, but want to sing in the choir and they're able to sing in the choir by using, you know, whatever you call it, this translation, uh, the, the phonics, the American phonics in order to, to develop the, you know, the Greek words in our music, uh, in our churches and, uh, and for many others who would like to learn how to speak Greek, uh, but don't know the alphabet. And so I, I don't see a huge danger in this. I think it, it's used for very specific reasons and in very specific ways. And I think it only improves uh, the, the dissemination of the language to people who can't read Greek. Yeah, that's another perspective. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, this is a good question. Any other point. questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah, Anastasia, go ahead. Well, I wanted to agree with everybody. So basically, the <laughs> the use of 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 Greek list is very limited. It is very time bound. So indeed, uh, Eleni, it was associated as a practice, you know, with a specific time. But right now, spell checkers are available and Greek fonts are available. So. Even people like myself, I have used it in the past because I really- yeah, of there was no choice. <laughs> yeah, but now not anymore. And my students likewise, because you, you now have the choice of Greek. And then for practical purposes, it definitely serves this particular purpose. And uh, we can't see, we can't think of Greeklish as language. It is a writing code. Okay, that's the point that Zoe made at the beginning. It is a writing code. It's independent of um, of Greek in a way, and you know, Greek. Exactly. Is, it's been spoken for like three and a half thousand years, and going strong. I mean, I don't think we need to to worry in that respect. I think Elenia Agnostopoulos wanted to ask a question. Yes, uh, I I noticed that the Greek Americans are mixing up the language because they, they heard it the way their parents said the Greek. But when they communicate, they put English words in there. And because of the computers and because the English language has less syllables, they use even in Greece, this Greek, Greek, Greek English, like they say, Anna set piata. What does it mean, set piata? <laughs> Anna, I don't know what it means. Agora is a canurio set piata. We say it in Greek. I know, but the set is, is it's not Greek. Yeah. It's, it's not, not Greek. Greek. 
It's yeah, not exactly. me. It's not they me. are it's using the English words because they are shorter and uh, and many other words like the lady before she said um, um, uh, hobby hobby it's a hobby yeah the word hobby yeah. is no Greek no Greek. But if I may answer, I would say that there is a procedure which is very uh, common in languages, which is called borrowing. And this is the result of uh, language contact. When languages get the, into contact, the one goes next to the other. So therefore, eventually, the eventually, we are going to borrow so many things into Greek language that we won't be able to understand the original attic. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the classic Greek. And another thing that contribute to that is because in Greece, they eliminated the ancient Greek in high school, the way I had it when I was in high school in Greece. I agree. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. What languages change because they have to adapt to the new situation. So that's that true. Thing. It's a living yeah. thing. It's a and that's, going to, to change. And that's how Greek has arrived because it has changed. That I wanted to stress that. And the uh, borrowing, yeah, happens. Actually, which is the civilization that gives words? Is the, the civilization which uh, the one um, which is the more prestigious, the one who produces uh, spirit, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's that was Greek during the Hellenistic period and the classical period. Today it's English because they have the technology. And that's why we have to, um, when we import a product, then we have to, to, to import also a term for that. And we have two choices, either to take the lexical loan word, for instance, computer or smartphone. And it's funny because we sometimes tell it smartphone and not smartphone. Mm -hmm. or we have to translate it in Greek. Sometimes the um, effort to translate wasn't very successful. For instance, uh, CD, it was translated as um, Psyphiakos Discos. So imagine to say, oh, today, Simera Agora Sanin Kenurio Psyphiakos Disco. That's difficult. No chance. <laughs> so it's, it's easier to say Simera Agora Sanin Kenurio CD. There is a question in the chat, so I just want because it's already said, I, I knew we we're going to have a lively discussion, um, uh, but I, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. So there is a uh, question at the chat. Can you discuss when the pronunciation of the letters and word changed? Was it gradual over the centuries or was it relatively quick? Of course, it was very slow. It was very gradual. Uh, we couldn't see in the synchrony of the language, but it wasn't the diachrony of the language that these changes took place. So it wasn't that like uh, one day we woke up and we spoke, we use another term or something like that. No, it took a lot of years in order to have these changes. So yes, actually it was gradual. And I see another uh, comment, comment in the chat. Uh, Mrs. or Mr. Papadimitou said, this is code switching, refer, responding to Eleni Anagnostopoulos' uh, uh, comment before. Actually, yes, we have either code switching, which is very common in uh, bilingual communities like the Greek Americans, not only the Greek Americans, in all bilingual communities. And this uh, arrives in order to um, actually express, exp uh, express their uh, double identity or uh, for uh, not having lexical gaps, etc. But there is another phenomenon. I see the word here, keki, which is the cake. And actually, uh, with Anastasia, we have a very nice research about long blends, which are words like blocky, fancy, skurili. The other day, somebody told me that skurili is the skiuros, skiuraki. Uh, and by the way, do you know the etymology of skiuros? The one who makes shade with its uh, ura tail. Okay, so skurili, fancy, blocky, fena, uh, what else? A lot of things like that, which are called long blends, and they are used. Televisa. 
or something like that? Televisa, ne, ne, ne. This is watermelon. This is something different. This is the pronunciation. Okay. Το σαλιβόρι τι είναι. Δεν το ξέρω, δεν το έχω στο πρόβλημα. Μου το έχουν εξηγήσει ως πεζοδρόμιο. Σαλιβόρι, τι μπορεί να είναι αυτό. Δεν μπορώ να... Δεν μου είναι... Το έλεγε όταν, όταν πρώτο είχα έρθει στην Αμερική από την Ελλάδα, του, ο, ο, ο θείος μου, δεύτερη ναι. γενιάς Έλληνα. Ναι. Μου έλεγε, μου έλεγε πάμε, λέει, πάμε, μην, 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 μην περπατάς στον δρόμο, πάνω στο Σαλιβόρι. Σαλιβόρι. Και τώρα, Ποια είναι, πώς είναι στα αγγλικά, είναι... Ναι. Από το sidewalk, it is a ah, place of sidewalk. Μάλλον από το sidewalk, sidewalk. Ναι. Δεν θα το καταλάβαινα καθόλου, ενώ άλλα... μου είχαν πει το άλλο το μπιλοζύρι, είναι Α, εδώ ναι, στο όταν πρέπει η θερμοκρασία. Βρίζεσαι το λέκι στα μπιλοζύρια. Μπιλόζυρα ακριβώ. έτσι. Άρχισαν τα μπιλοζύρια, στο Σικάγο πάντως τώρα. Ναι, ναι, εδώ είμαι, εδώ είμαι, Σικάγο είμαι και Can I add one more thing, uh, like going back to, to Zoe's point about the prestige of a language, and uh, I want to say that it is a bit unfair to say that the prestigious language right now is English, okay? I think this is actually not true. The, when it comes to technology, a lot of words come from English because they refer to objects. But Greek continues to be very influential, along with Latin, in the scientific vocabulary. So every time, you know, in, in linguistics or in political science or in philosophy or in art, like you think about a new concept or a new thing that you want to name, like take the example of Facebook, you know, it was named Meta, okay? Mm -hmm. So they are looking at a Greek word to be able to make it sound prestigious. So Greek, classical Greek especially, continues to have in the Western audience a certain allure and a certain gravitas, which is the product of the thousands of years of Greek being a source of scientific vocabulary. So from the Greek perspective, sure, we have a bunch of words that have to do mainly with technology that we borrow. Okay, so we borrow the objects and therefore we borrow the words for those objects. But whenever we, in science, we need, or in art, we need to think of new concepts, one of the first things we do if we want to make them attractive is look into Greek or Latin, but mostly into Greek. And meta is just one case that I, there are many others that one can think of the recent. Uh, do you remember what Zuckerberg had said? My classic education allows me to yeah. understand what meta means. So exactly. actually, yeah, yeah. But Anastasia, prestige is one of the reasons for a language to be recognized and widely used. Right. Uh, there are some other reasons, like uh, political ones, economic ones. In this case, it's the technology because they in produce English, a, for English, yeah. it's the technology. E exactly. Right. Yeah, it's the technology, right? But we continues to be so. There is no, I mean, continues to be very influential in terms in the West. Maybe more so outside of Greece, because if you are in Greece, you don't need to borrow anything from Greek. You speak Greek inside Greece, but it continues. I yeah, but it continues to be a vexamene, like a, a repository of, of a lot of vocabulary and new words that are being created. Yeah. I can see in the chat, sorry, yeah, evangelist. Anastasia, you're, you're right, both of you are right. It's because this is a sophisticated, very ancient language based mm -hmm. on philosophy, science, and technology. Right. So the modern people, use it because it's very useful to them and it expresses ideas that you cannot express it by using an English or French or Russian uh, term. Mm -hmm. Because of this background, why do modern Greeks borrow, bring all these foreign line, line, words into the language while they can go back to the ancient Greek and bring back ancient Greek words and make them modern Greek? They borrow the objects, Evangelia. They, you borrow the objects, so you borrow the iPad. So once you import iPad, Okay, the easiest thing in order to look cool or young and hip and partake into the universal cu culture is to also adopt the word for it. Look at the door porta. Why would we say porta instead of using thera? We have a <laughs> that, that, That's very important. We use thera. We do. In some cases, for instance, the, okay. the gate, no, at the computer, uh, the... Thera? Also for gate, like in the in a stadium, you have Thera F yeah. Thera but of also in technology, Anastasia, you know, if Thera USB. Yeah. So either it, it is use it. So and that's the amazing. Greek word, 
right, the Greek words are being used. Remember in our class, we had that conversation about aspros que lefkos. Okay, so the word lefkos is yeah. still used for abstract nouns, lefkos thanatos, lefko lai, lefko prosopo, lefki fili, but lefko krasi. For but, lexicalized items, yeah, we yeah, use it yeah. now. And that's I, 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 mm -hmm. is not dead, not by I, any means, yeah. I want because we I uh, it's already eight fifteen. I want to give. Uh, I see uh, Michael Karamanis. If it's okay, let's put a specific uh, because I don't I don't want to exhaust. Uh, sorry, um, maybe another five minutes. So I will uh, put a hard stop at eight twenty. But I definitely want to give a chance to uh, uh, Michael Karamanis first, and then Elias uh, the baggies to ask their questions. Yeah. Thank you. Very quickly, I would like to say that this uh, this uh, bringing back a Greek word uh, as opposed to using uh, using a foreign word is it has gone both ways. For example, when the when the first buses were brought in Greece, we used to call them busaki, but it didn't catch. Whereas leoforio became an acceptable word. word. So it goes back and forth. That's one thing. The second thing is that when you borrow from another language. I think it is very important, and this goes back to, uh, to the script that one is using, to somehow convey this borrowing in the, uh, in the, uh, in the spelling. Uh, for example, in English, it's quite transparent whether a Greek word, uh, whether a word is Greek or not, because phi is spelled with PH and so on and so forth. Right, so they've maintained somehow a, tra a, tra a, tran a transliteration of the of the spelling, whereas in Spanish that's not the case. That was that was also true in in Greek with treno, for example, which was written with alpha yota, and I think that was very interesting because it conveyed the 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 information that treno is a foreign word from train, train, and so on and so forth. But now, now we write it with an epsilon. With epsilon. So we are shifting. We are shifting towards the the Spanish um, um, direction of simplifying things. And simplifying in spelling is not always a good thing, because you lose information. Okay. Thank you for the, the comment. Time. Thank yes. you for the comment. And uh, uh, Elias, uh, the last. Uh, Question or comment? Ευχαριστώ. Ε, κα, ήθελα, ήθελα να πω ότι χάρηκα από το παράδειγμα τη θύρα ήταν η θύρα 7. Αλλά είχε γίνει και μία, και μία ερώτηση προηγουμένω γιατί έχουμε το γάμα. Γάλα... Yes, not everybody in this audience uh, speaks Greek. I understand. I understand. So uh, there, was, there was also a question earlier. Why do we use G γάμα γάμα and G γάμα κάπα? Ευχαριστώ. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you know that uh, in Greek, in some cases, the word angelos, I pronounce it with n. Do you hear angelos? Okay. Do you hear the n? The same. How do you pronounce right, right in chat? Kapotnos. So, uh, give me a second. Yeah. How do you pronounce this word? I hope not signomi, not signomi, signomi. Why? Because it's the preposition sin plus gnomi opinion. Okay. So this first gamma is used in order to write down this sound, the as we call it, hyperoikoni, this uh, N word. So, and what's what we have then? We have the, the other gamma. So actually here is syngnome. That's why we have the gamma gamma. The same with gamma kappa as pume. Agonas. Yeah, or syngopi. It's the same. Okay, we hear this. It's the hyperoikoni, the n that exists before k, g, h, and g. So that's why we have gamma gamma or gamma kappa. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I I know that we could keep going on forever. This is such a an interesting topic, and uh, everybody uh, has both uh, uh, in in some cases knowledge, in some cases you know like strong feelings. It is our language; we feel for it. And um, uh, uh, this has been so so informative. Thank you so much. 
Maybe on a different occasion, um, uh, we can uh, bring uh, Professor Gavrili the bag to see the topic from a different perspective. Um, there are two things that I would like um, to uh, uh, put uh, on the agenda for another time. One is the computational linguistic perspective and to which, uh, 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 to which extent it would be possible to um, to build a model that would predict these changes. Is there enough regularity to be able to predict what uh, new words or which ones will survive, which not? I think that would be very interesting to see if there is a particular model that kind of um, uh, explains, so to speak, uh, all this uh, variation. And the other thing that I would like to put on the table for another time is the work um, I would definitely like to uh, learn more about the work that you are doing with the Greek language curriculum, um, both the studies and also the effort. I know uh, uh, for a fact that at uh, the Hellenic University Club, we have talked a little bit. Uh, um, we have talked a little bit about this. Um, what would be um, good ways of actually um, uh, promoting uh, the the learning? of the language um, uh, in the United States by uh, different uh, uh, populations and kind of in a more uh, sophisticated way. So these are two topics that, uh, that are too big by themselves. Definitely, we cannot discuss them all today, but I wanted to uh, put them on the table as um, kind of, um, you know, to, to, as, as a teaser to hopefully uh, uh, lure you uh, back and continue this conversation. But for today, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, everyone uh, for coming and attending this talk. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we will have the recording and make it available. I know um, a lot of people that um, could not make it today and ask for the recording, including, including my own family that are, you know, my, my, my son is playing soccer right now and could not uh, attend uh, the talk. And of course, um, um, Professor Zoe Gabriel um, uh, it, it will have been so hard to have this talk when she was in Greece due to the time difference. So I feel uh, very lucky that uh, we have her now in very close by time zones. So now this is possible. And um, thank you very much for this amazing talk. Um, and uh, we really hope to uh, bring you back to continue um, the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Zoe. Thank you very much, Eleni. I would like to thank the audience uh, because you've been an amazing audience today. Uh, I really like the discussion and I hope we'll meet maybe uh, in person. I don't know. I yes, guess. maybe we can do a spring yeah. event or, uh, okay. you know, when the weather is nicer <laughs> and um, kind of we all feel safer uh, with, with COVID. Definitely something that uh, we will consider. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good evening. And uh, we hope to see you at one of our uh, next events very soon. And again, thank you, Zay. Bye.